everyone. Um, I think uh, we'll keep this as informal as possible. So please feel free to take a, the food and drinks um, and have a seat. Um, yeah, I'll do a very quick introduction of um, T and, and, and myself here. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for actually making the time to come down this Saturday uh, during the very busy period in Singapore Art Week. Uh, my name is Shahida and I'm the curator who has been uh, supporting T in her debut presentation of 47 Days Soundless, which is um, downstairs at level one. So um, before we start this conversation, I just wanted to mention that uh, 47 Days Soundless is commissioned by the Han Nafkins Foundation, uh, Mori Art Museum, and Plus Hong Kong, um, together with Sam as part of the Biennial Moving Image Commission Grant, which supports artistic production um, in the field of moving image in Asia. So you get to see the same work uh, that will come um, to M Plus Hong Kong as well as Mori Art Museum in the next few months. So thank you, Mr. Han Nafkins, um, as well as Ms. Hilda Chilling uh, for being here today with us today. So um, some formalities before I hand over the mic to T. Um, I'd like to introduce very quickly our artists, um, who, if some of you are not aware. So, Nguyen Trinity is a Hano-based uh, experimental filmmaker, I'm sorry, and moving image media artist whose practice over the last decade has consistently engaged with the history and memory of Vietnam. Um, she has found innovative ways to connect cinema and the moving image with sound practices, uh, performance and alternative forms of storytelling. T uses montage to compose her work, drawing on different media from her audio and visual recordings to found footage and still images from postcards, photography, newsreels, Hollywood films, and, and ethnographic footage. Her practice currently explores the power of sound and listening and the multiple relations between image, sound, and space with ongoing interest in memory, representation, landscape, indigeneity, and ecology. So T's work has been shown quite widely around the world, including the recently opened Thailand Biennial in Chiang Rai, which is still ongoing, so please do catch it, um, and Documenta 15, uh, produced in 2022. Uh, we will be discussing the works that she produced for these two works in a bit, and, and also just lastly, T is the director of Hanoi Doc Lab, which is an independent center for documentary, film, and moving image art since which she founded in 2009. So yeah, just for those who haven't seen yet, the exhibition is in level one in front of the cafe in the engine room. Um, so I'll just give a brief introduction to the show before I leave it to T to kind of explain a bit more. So 47 Days Soundless um, really at its core uh, continues T's exposition in um, what it means to think about the entangled relationship between a place and its inhabitants, uh, while also challenging our modes of seeing and drawing emphasis on why listening and hearing is very important today. And I say listening and hearing, which I think T can expand a bit more. They're two very different terms. So we're gonna get a sense of her approaches towards sound in her recent works before we actually come back to the um, current work, which is the 47 Days Soundless. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming today. Um, thank you so much, Han and um, Sam, uh, Shahida, for um, having been supporting me for uh, the last few months, and Andre. Um, so I would go um, back to the, this is the work downstairs that we would come back a bit later. Um, I would talk a little bit about the, the other two projects that I have worked on uh, for the last few years that um, actually kind of, um, in a way it's, it's, it's kind of like a new direction for me because um, previously um, I was mostly doing a moving image and experimental film. Um, maybe you have seen some in Singapore. Um, I did one actually um, video installation for the Singapore Biennale in 2013, I think. Um, that is with uh, uh, many artists performing the eating uh, of uh, different food. Um, and um, so, so to me, um, it's uh, development and uh, something change. Uh, I, I'm always welcome, you know, kind of like changing in ideas and thinking. 
And um, I just mentioned to Han that I feel, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, um, but I feel like the COVID time was actually something that I feel like it kind of changed my direction, maybe pushed me even more into some other area. And I feel like um, now increasingly, um, I really like to explore the, um, you know, other kind of um, elements in, in work, um, um, kind of beyond the, the image. Um, I feel like our um, culture, um, uh, you know, in the modern era has been um, the, um, you know, the, the visual, the visual sense has been um, becoming like very uh, dominating and to the extent that um, it um, <coughs> kind of, kind of a, li a little bit kind of suppress, you know, other kind of senses. And <coughs> in my working with um, other uh, cultures, like uh, indigenous cultures, traditional cultures, um, I feel like um, there are many different ways of perceiving the world. Uh, not not all the time, like you know, with the uh, with the eyes, you know, um, like the um, with the community that I work with in uh, Central Vietnam, the indigenous people there for for a very long time. Um, the way they perceive the world is actually through the ears, and their their whole vocabulary is like full of expressions that um, mention the ears. It connect to the um, intellect. <clears throat> memories and um, yeah and and I feel like um, I feel like I, I kind of like to to explore that kind of area and the question for me is how how can I do this in um, in combination with moving image of course like for film you you know it's we always say that you know the the visual and the soundtrack are the two main elements of film but in, in reality, uh, the visual in the film has been always the, um, the dominant ones. And sound is, 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 not, is not that, you know, kind of important. Um, and I also like to explore the, um, the spatial um, elements of sound too. And this kind of um, coincide with my interest in uh, ecology and environment, and I think the like sound um, <coughs> sound can express the space and uh, and the environment um, and the presence too. Um, so uh, this is the work that I did for Documenta 15, 2022. Um, this one, in this one, um, I use the um, indigenous uh, musical instruments. Um, I basically I learned from the way they play it. Um, I got the inspiration from how they play it. Actually, in the um, in the in their way of playing, um, nobody can play like the whole band, but they have to play together. So it's the point of their playing, it's, it's a collective. So each person can play only one flute and make only one note. So you have to play together and you have to listen to each other. And the same way with playing gongs, like um, the gong is very important in their culture. And there would be like maybe more than 20 people and each one have one gong and going around and you have to uh, improvise, you have to listen to each other, and you play only one note, but together you play the whole song. Um, so that kind of thing is very, um, um, it's, it's kind of like an inspiration for me. I made, so I made this uh, set of flutes. Uh, I have to work with a um, traditional uh, musical instrument maker to design and, and, and make this that can that can be played automatically by machine by uh, air compressor, and um, so I feel in this new way of work of like mixed media, actually, 
I still work in the same way as uh, being an editor when I edit my film. The, the difference is that like when I edit my film, it's the material is uh, it's a film um, and the footage. But in the mixed media kind of um, work, uh, it's still editing, um, but it's connecting different, um, I mean, this, this, you still have to go through the same kind of research, uh, the same kind of uh, thinking and conceptualization. Um, the material can be different, like you can kind of marry different um, mediums and um, materials, uh, but, but it's still, the main thing is still like connecting each, like many different points. Um, so, in this work, actually, I work with an uh, autobiographical novel by Bung Ngoc Tấn, because I, I worked with him before, and then he passed away. And um, he wrote uh, in the novel about his experience uh, being in detention camp uh, in the 60s and 70s in the Vietnam. And uh, that, that was during the war. And um, so that, that so the, he had to perform um, forced labor in the forest. Um, and so when I reread his novel, I was, um, I was very interested in the, um, in the way that he looked at the forest and the ecology. And actually he described his experience being in a prison, in the camp, but, um, but his view is, is, is larger than that. You know, it's not like, you know, just like, oh, I'm the victim and I'm a prisoner. But it's, it's really kind of looking at the nature and the, the ecology. So I was very interested in that. And <clears throat> so for this work, I came back to the site where uh, the, his camp was. And uh, I used um, a wind uh, sensor. And I installed the wind sensor at the site to get the real life data. And it, it will be um, uh, transmitted to the exhibition space, and we would we have the controlling system that would um, make the flute play <coughs> according to the wind in Vietnam, in the forest. Um, and then, uh, in his novel, he also talk about there's this beautiful scene, beautiful but very tragic scene of. Uh, Chile forest and the shooting of the prisoners. So I, I'm, I use a lot of, uh, of Chile plants um, and, and kind of uh, work with the light, lighting system that also read the data from the forest and make the shadows. So the light and the shadows also change with the wind and the flutes. Um, so to me, this this way of, of making a work, it's um, kind of connecting um, different levels of like, um, somebody actually described the work for me, I think it's uh, in a good way, so I would just copy him. So he said that it's a good example of a combination of um, uh, technology, storytelling, and site specificity. Um, so, um, so in this one, I work with this um, this site. It's the um, it's a fortress, very old fortress in castle. It's uh, built in like 15th century, and it's so thick. It's like 10 meters thick wall. Um, so, and then inside, it's a kind of a um, um, it's a dome shape. And it's, um, so I design and I build this stage in the middle um, for people to, so I imagine that this would be kind of like a 360 degree kind of theater and, and the people would be located in the middle and the, on the shadow of the, the forest would be around them and then the, the sound of the flute would be from above them. And I, I wanted for people when they sit in here, they feel like they, are, they were disappearing and they feel like they are very small and insignificant. And um, for the flute, uh, because in the novel there was a, 
scene of uh, an indigenous prisoner who got killed. And um, so I kind of research and I find the, the kind of flutes that, that people play in that area in northern Vietnam. And so I made the flutes that, you know, have the similar kind of um, scales, um, the pan pentatonic scale, um, that the wind now would be playing. Um, yeah, so the appearance of the work is quite simple. It's, uh, you actually, you don't see anything much, you know, you, um, mostly you just see shadows and changing in the shadows and hear the sound. Um, yeah, but I think I'm kind of interested in, um, I guess there would be a few things that um, in this kind of new way of making work, um, I guess I'm, I'm interested in kind of the relationship between um, people and nature and um, um, ecological system. But um, I feel like um, if I continue to uh, make work in a way that I film or I record or I describe the nature or the landscape, um, essentially it's still, it's still like my, the view is still for me and it's, it's still like a human gaze you know, to nature, and I'm not very interested in that. So I think my kind of new direction is like, I was trying to think of a way to, um, to learn from and to, to find, you know, what kind of uh, mechanism of communications that um, other things, non-human things might use to express or to communicate and try to use that in my work. Um, so in this way, um, the fact that the, the flutes have always played uh, automatically by the wind sensor and, and it's a live performance, um, I feel like I can kind of collaborate with other forces like natural or invisible forces. I feel in a way um, it's uh, invisible and somewhat uh, spiritual um, uh, forces. I'm not sure which one, but it's, it's just kind of like, you know, kind of like um, try to be open and, and make it um, possible. Um, that maybe it's the kind of spiritual um, elements can, can come in, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but I think, so for me, like for work like this, the, the fact that I cannot, I cannot control everything, I cannot compose everything, um, I try to build kind of a framework or the, the infrastructure and the instruments, but I kind of let the other elements, other forces to come in and perform and play as well. Um, yeah, so that is kind of a kind of a new, new, new direction for me. T, shall we try and play the video so that uh, uh, yes, the yes. audience get yes. to see it?
to the next one? This slide? The next one? Yeah. The next project? Oh, you don't want to talk about the detention? Uh, I already mentioned it. I oh. think we don't have time to uh, go. Okay. Yeah. I think I, I kind of prefer to have more time for Q&A, so we <laughs> try to go more quickly. But if you have questions, like, uh, about any uh, projects, then ask me later. We can go through the slides quickly. Yeah, yeah so that's the um, instrument maker that I work with uh, in Hanoi. He had to make like a very big um, uh, flute that's not played by people, but <laughs> by machine. This, uh, so this is another project. Can you go back to that? Yeah. This one is uh, going on now in Chiang Rai, if you have time to see it. It's uh, until uh, end of April. Um, and I was so lucky to just go back, go back. I was very lucky to get this really beautiful uh, venue. It's the, inside the Mafe Luang Park. It's, um, it's, a, it's a park where they uh, try to preserve the uh, Lana civilization. Um, so like this building was uh, huge and it was built from more than 30 uh, old wooden tick houses, uh, you know, of like Lana style. And inside they display uh, many traditional and religious objects of the Lana civilization. And actually in the middle, there's also Buddha uh, altar and people still come, come in to pray. So it's, it's a very spiritual uh, kind of space. Um, so when I was invited to do uh, something for the Th Thailand Biennale and um, the, the, the curators there uh, for the Biennale, they really wanted for the artists to come and uh, do something locally and kind of do something that connect to the culture of the place. Um, so I, I, I travel a bit uh, in, the, in the area and I was, um, <clears throat> I, I was very interested in talking about the Mekong River because actually the Mekong go through uh, many countries in Southeast Asia and you know, from Tibet, China, and then go down to Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and at the end it's Vietnam. And now there are so many problems with the uh, with, uh, river. And uh, it's actually, it's um, you know, some local activists, uh, environmentalists, they, um, they talk about kind of like the, the river is uh, dying. It's really dying, you know, from many like construction dams, constructions in China and Laos, and um, so you know, biodiversity is going down a lot. And Vietnam actually uh, is the last country, and it's it suffer maybe the most. Um, now we don't really have like sediments in the water, and the water is kind of like changing the flows like all the time and not, not like naturally anymore. And um, yeah, so I, I wanted to, to work, some, to do something about the Mekong River and I found um, uh, a group of local activists, uh, environmentalists. They built a school by, um, by the river and they have been fighting for more than 10 years um, to um, to defend the river and be against like uh, construction uh, projects, and uh, it was very inspiring for me. And I I wanted to um, so I we actually we installed the um, water turbine in the river there at the school, and we get the um, we use a water sensor and to measure the movement of the water, and um, and then get the real the real time data to to the venue, and then also animate, um, play the uh, the instrument. So I was also doing the research on the um, local and indigenous uh, music musical instruments in the region, and visited uh, different um, groups and see how they play their instruments. And a lot would be using like bamboo, of course. Um, and um, 
but at the end, you know, to work with this venue, because it's, it's a tick, tick building, um, and um, it's so large, and I feel also that in such a spiritual space, um, I feel like sound would be, uh, would be much more appropriate than visual. I feel like with visual, it's a bit kind of uh, imposing um, and competing, but I think sound is really kind of like belong to the environment. And um, so I asked them to, uh, to turn off all the lights, the lighting inside the, the, the house and only get, let the natural lights coming in through the, through the gaps. Um, and then uh, I use the Thai, um, the Thai, uh, the Ranat, the Ranat egg. It's a Thai xylophone. It's, a, it's, a in, it's an instrument that is a very popular in Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, that has many wooden tick um, pieces. And so I, I took them apart and put them on around the floor of the, of the um, structure. And uh, make, make them play with the mallet. So I make this video to just to show kind of a little bit. In the space, you don't really see these instruments. I put them behind the um, religious objects. So for, for this work, you, you actually also hear the flutes that I used before. And, but they, the two instruments, they play different kind of data. The, the ranat, the, the xylophone, um, they, they connect to the real-time uh, sensor that measure the water level in Mekong. And the flutes, they actually they play uh, historical data of the water level in, also in Mekong, but um, 
for the last uh, 70 years. And actually, I have two sets of flutes, and they play against each other. One play the data for 70 years, that, so that show the natural flow of the river. And the other set play the, um, um, the data that come from after the dam construction. So actually it show how um, the water level have been changed and become unnatural now. So the two kind of play against each other. Um, yeah, so, and for the, so this is, we did the research in the Mekong, and I actually, I tried to uh, record the sound from inside, uh, like uh, putting the, the microphone down uh, to get the sound from the river, but uh, actually at the end, I didn't use that sound. So the sound of, of the work was like played by musical instruments. This is the, um, people call him Crew T, Crew T, meaning teacher uh, T. Um, he's a very, very inspiring person. He, he's a local person in Chiang Hong. And he set up this Mekong school and he's a local there and he fought for uh, decades, you know, as a environmentalist. And actually last year or the year before, he won the, the, uh, the case because in um, Thailand, they, um, they have a project with China to blast the bottom of the river to really widen the river to, um, to make space for a um, huge cruise ship from China to bring many people over as tourists. Um, so that one, if it that happened, they would have to blast like many, many, like I don't know, more than 50 kilometers of the of the river, and they already started. But the local, um, they they were really fighting and for more than 10 years. But finally, they won the case, and I think that's a very rare kind of victory for a local kind of protest. But that was very inspiring. And he showed me like how he keep the record of like the water level, like every month or something. And he showed like how now the water level have been changed. You know, like the rainy season, it's going down and the dry season is going up. And when, it, when things change like that, it's just affect on kind of um, animals and fish and, um, uh, you know, like biodiversity, it's just being really affected. So that is kind of their school there that uh, hosts a lot of uh, workshops for local people. They try to um, teach the kids and everyone about their own culture and also like science and environment yeah so we we met with the uh, in in Chiang Rai there were a lot of different kind of um, of ethnic groups there were so many and uh, they they had many different kinds of um, instruments yeah and this is a group that uh, is called Kamu and they live right by the river and actually they during the Vietnam War they had to go um, they were from Laos but they have to like, you know, get over the mountain to this side and live in Thailand. And now they settle by the river in Thailand on this side. So they play many instruments and mostly made of bamboo. This is just my equipment. <laughs> Actually, I have to take this picture to send to um, the, the um, Thailand Biennale organizer, like a ministry, because they, <laughs> to prove that I'm actually working, <laughs> I have to show that I have in, uh, like um, equipment. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we try to record the sound from the river. Yeah. And this is all the, the spots that, um, that we came to record the, the river sound. Um, around uh, Chiang Hong and Chiang Sen. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a Thai instrument that uh, you can 
maybe in Singapore, maybe you have this, right? Do you have this one? No. Not, <laughs> not that I know. Maybe. Of. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of like this deconstruct. Um, I take I take all of this apart, and we are kind of trying to to build something to for it to be able to play automatically. And yeah, and this is the graph that I use um, the the data that uh, show the historical um, water level and the change. So I made like kind of like two graphs and put it in the musical shaft to make it into notes, into music. Yeah, so at the end it become kind of this piece of music that the flute would play. Yeah, so now we go back to this current work uh, downstairs. So I feel like um, in this work, I, um, I was able to combine um, the, my current interest in sound and kind of my previous work in moving image. And I was trying to, um, to do both. I was, it, it's a big challenge for me because um, at the beginning I was trying to think um, how, how, can I, um, how can I put, you know, film, um, but in, uh, in an installation that um, can work both as a film that kind of retain people's uh, attention and kind of people's uh, traditional way of watching, you know, like uh, when you sit down to watch a film, you would watch from beginning to end. And you kind of have to, I, I kind of want to keep the people's attention in that way. I don't want it, people to completely just like wander in and out, like um, normally in a gallery or in, in installation that is, it's, um, I think normally the attention for things in installation um, is kind of too scattered for me. You know, I, I, I feel like I want, still want people to, to have kind of a sustained, sustained kind of um, attention. But at the same time, I am also interested in the, in the space and in the presence. And, and I want the, the audience to, to be aware of, of where they are and aware of everything around them. And I don't want to put people like completely in kind of a, you know, like a, Illusion that um, <laughs> you know that that they are in in some some other kind of reality. I, I still want them to feel their own presence. So, um, but you know, like the the way people watch uh, cinema or film, and the way people be in a gallery or in installation, those are like two kind of like opposite modes of, of watching and of um, uh, experiencing. Um, so my kind of challenge that I set for myself in this work is um, how I can do both. Um, and I was, I was actually, I was thinking of uh, theater and, um, but, but maybe kind of, Mm. So, um, I mean, at the end, the, the work beca became kind of uh, maybe having a few different um, parts that connect to each other um, that uh, you can, maybe you can move from like one mode to the other and it's, it's kind of fluid, it's, it's a bit fluid. And um, because uh, during the installation, and uh, we learn a lot from, you know, the fact that when you make a work at home um, or in your studio, but when you bring it to a specific space, um, you just have to change it to, to fit it in uh, with the specific space or the environment around it. Um, although it's a, a museum or gallery and it's a kind of white box, but um, but it's, each one has um, right, really different kind of characteristics of uh, acoustics, of uh, you know, kind of um, 
spatial kind of uh, feeling. And also, uh, there would be other works um, next door, and we don't want to kind of like, you know, compete or, um, uh, you know, it's, it's different, it's difficult too. And um, so, what can I say? Is there any photos? Or it's just, just more installation shots. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Exhibition. Okay. So, I... Um, I mean, for this one, I, I was interested in, um, in general, I was interested in uh, peripheral vision. Um, it's, how to describe it, like... I like to describe it <laughs> as the corner of our eyes. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Like what you see kind of in the other corner of your eyes or maybe something that is it's happening in the environment uh, like around you and you don't see it like kind of like directly in front of you um, but it's actually peripheral vision it's very important it's important for your sense of being for your sense of presence and your sense of um, uh, safety you know like if you lose the peripheral vision it would be very dangerous like for sports people that's how they protect their safety, you know, like they move very quickly and they don't need to see very, very um, um, kind of exactly what is happening, but they can sense it, you know, and I think the peripheral vision is very, very much like, uh, like sound in a way, because it's, it's happening around. Um, so, I, so I was interested in uh, experimenting with uh, projecting, uh, with the set of, of mirrors. So the, these mirrors, they would project images everywhere and, and kind of more like uh, surrounding and more like sound. And um, uh, so I, I propose this idea um, that uh, it's actually, it's kind of a continuation of my previous work that I, um, when I deal with, um, um, found footage, and I, I work with a lot of uh, existing um, fiction films, like um, I did one with many um, films that talk about Vietnam, and but talking about Vietnam, like foreign films, that almost 100% would be war film, would be like Vietnam war films. Um, so I already did that before, and uh, but for this one now, I still, um, Notice that now, like Hollywood uh, companies, they continue to to go to countries like Vietnam. Actually, now they go more to Vietnam than before. Before, like if they shoot for um, Vietnam War, they would go to uh, Philippines or Thailand uh, because it's much easier. Um, so they use the landscape of of other countries in Southeast Asia um, to. Uh, portray the Vietnam War, and they also like hire local people. And like in the case of uh, Apocalypse Now, um, they hire the whole village of uh, Ifugao people in the Philippines, and uh, they would live uh, this whole village of Ifugao. They would live on the production side for like the whole year, uh, and these indigenous people they would act or they would stand for um, uh, indigenous people in Vietnam. So they actually, they would, they would stand for the, the people that I already work with in Vietnam. And, but it's very interesting to me that, um, you know, seeing the scene of uh, buffalo killing ritual in apoc Apocalypse Now, and I also shot the, the same ritual for with the indigenous people in Vietnam. It's a, like a coincidence, but it's um, kind of an interesting connection to me. Um, so for this one, I have the idea that um, I kind of want to reverse this, um, this way of, of, of shooting, um, a foreign location shooting. Um, um, because in, in all these films, if you watch, um, y you would see it, it's quite green, you know, like with a background, like they would shoot um, in, in Chiang Mai or Chiang Rai or something as well. Um, and, but actually, like, um, 
it's it's very difficult to to get the the scene that has the um, um, kind of take the nature as a um, as the main point. You know, it's always it's it's the background. Uh, it's very very mostly it's very blurry. It's it's the background and the indigenous people um, they are like um, also bl blurry or uh, kind of unidentified, you know, it can be anyone. Um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to reverse that and I, I wanted to use the, these um, existing films and um, just kind of get the, the natural part and the like a forest scene or plants or something uh, to become the, the foreground. And um, also very difficult to find the parts in, the, in those films um, that have the natural sound, you know, maybe of the forest or the birds or something, uh, kind of more purely, because everything was, would be kind of the background of action and uh, pu uh, human action and um, drama. So it's... Um, I, I really have to zoom in to many things and also get the very small parts of, of sound. And I also work um, to get the sound from many uh, um, indigenous instruments and music to uh, compose my own uh, kind of soundtrack. Um, coming, so it's coming from the indigenous, indigenous uh, music and instruments. Um, and I, I took the very small parts that uh, kind of, to me, kind of like resemble um, some sounds from nature. So it's kind of like, you know, borrowing back um, what, you know, indigenous people take from nature and, and you know, make into their music. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like early, early part when, when I was uh, trying to experiment with uh, mirrors in my studio. Do you want to share how you changed the shape? Because <laughs> now it's round. Yeah, now it's round. Um, I, I think you, you have better answer for me. <laughs> she said that our vision is uh, it's like oval shape. It's not square, and I like that. <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it was a happy coincidence yeah. when we were talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, quite interestingly, the it's not round, it's elliptical. So it actually represents the visual field of how we see um, as mammals. So that was quite an interesting, intuitive coincidence for you, right? Here. Right. So for, th for this, this part, mostly I took the, um, the kind of background of, of nature from the films. And, um, but when you see it uh, in the circle one, and it kind of more close up, um, like to me, it, it looks kind of a bit like um, images that you might look see through the uh, microscope, and and you see some like grains or um, some details of leaves or rain or something. Um, T, maybe you want to share a bit a bit about also. Um, I think this is something we only figured out during the installation was to give the kind of agency for people to decide how do you want to experience the work. Yeah, do you want to like, share a bit more about that? Yeah, actually, it's still a kind of a challenge for me um, because uh, like in my mind, I, I kind of designed the space and I would have kind of like um, some idea of how, you know, people should, um, where they should sit and, and watch and everything. But uh, in reality, um, it's different. One is because uh, depending on the space, we, we, we have to change the setting a bit, but also, um, also I think like people tend to also keep the, um, the habit of watching. I, I kind of realize it because I made some work for some installation with screen being around and, and I try to put people in the middle and they would watch, uh, at one point, they would watch only one screen, but they hear the sound like everywhere. 
Um, but people don't like to watch it in that way. I think they people always like um, prefer to to sit on the side and be able to watch everything at once. I think that is kind of our habit of watching, and we we want to be in control of our kind of vision, and we want to to be able to see everything at once. So for this one, I actually I kind of I prefer for people to to sit on each side and and watch each uh, film separately and kind of pay attention to that film. And you can still hear the sound from the other one, but um, and then later you can go to, to watch the other film. Um, you also have an option of watching it from the side and you can see two screens at once. Uh, but, but then um, the two films would be uh, competing to each other and so um, you gain something, but you also lose something. So I would encourage people to try different way. Um, but now it looks like everyone chooses to sit on the side. So we just put the blocks in the middle, but uh, you know you can choose for yourself. Thanks so much, T. Um, maybe we can because I think we were running a bit of time, but I think we should open. Uh, questions to the floor. I think um, anybody has any questions, please don't be shy. Hi, CT. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for moderating. Um, I was watching the screen, so the way you were describing, so I sit on the beanbags in the middle and I was watching two screens at the same time. So a lot of people said it was like a um, peaceful experience, I was very stressed. I was like, how many scenes do I have to look at? <laughs> to like have to s kind of spread my visual periphery very thin. Um, but I do know, but I want to ask about the footage that you actually use in the, in the film, because some of them I noticed from your previous films, especially the parts where you shoot the indigenous groups and um, the Manong people, and the rituals and the sounds. And so I just wonder about the, um, like that kind of palimpsest, you know, like you layer things that you already did and then you layer it on, it on top of things that you recently extracted and then the sounds that you take from um, not only a natural elements but also, also artificial films. Just wondering like um, how do you process that, that intermingling of different parts and how do you layer them? Is it like an intuitive thing or do you have like a, a way of kind of pairing these things together to create an experience or to prompt people to think? I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah, I feel like my projects are just getting messier and messier. <laughs> Sometimes it has like way too many sources. Like if you, some of you might have seen my fifth cinema, it's millions of <laughs> sources. And um, uh, I think, I think I, I I don't really have kind of a specific methodology to begin with. And actually, I, I'm quite uh, scared of this word methodology, you know, like uh, sometimes I, maybe I make one or two kind of, my, my projects like from the beginning, they, they were all very different from each other, almost like nothing is uh, similar. And, but at some point, um, some points you kind of started to do things that is a little bit similar to each other. And um, if I do it like, you know, the second time or the third time, I would, f I feel like, oh shit, like now I, I can't do it. Like it's, it's, um, it doesn't help me, you know, to, to think or to, um, because I feel like I have to struggle to, to find the form that is, um, you know, kind of exact for, for this kind of specific thing that I'm trying to deal with or specific question. So, um, but like once you, you work many times, um, that would happen at some point that you feel like, oh, it's now it's so easy, so familiar, and it become kind of like methodology, you know, and th that is like when I feel like the, the alarm kind of w go off, you know, yes. And, and I, so I just want to throw everything away and start with something new. So may, I think maybe that is one of the reasons why I now I, I started to do these things that is completely different 
because I have to feel like um, when I start a project and uh, when I start to, to work on something, I, I, I really like the feeling of being a beginner. Like it's almost, I, I almost don't know anything and I ha really have to learn many things. You know, like for these things, I, I don't know anything. And I just uh, try to research, to read about different things and um, learn from other people. And I, I find that it's like, actually it's give me a lot if I just go the, the old way, you know, it's like, it's, I can make the products very quickly, but it's, it's not interesting. So, okay, to go back to your question. Um, I think in a way I, I, have, I have things that I have learned before and things that, that I have accumulated. And um, so I could still use them. Um, Actually, for this work, uh, when I did the proposal, I proposed that I would, I would go to Philippines. I would see the Ifugao people, I go back to Pleiku, and I um, did many uh, traveling. But at the end, I think it was maybe um, coincide with the period when it was uh, like you know after COVID and everything, and. Um, I think many of us started to kind of reassess um, our kind of, um, you know, necessity for traveling and for going everywhere. And um, I also, I have always used and reused material many times. And um, I work with a lot of different kind of found footage and I also kind of treat my own footage as found footage. Um, so they keep reappear, and and I now it's it's they they go from project to project, and I feel like they are not really different projects, and they are kind of like a di like one thing. Um, and I also I really like in in using file footage, I really like the idea of um, kind of exhausting the potentials of of existing material. It's, it's just the same like with um, recycling everything uh, material and it's it's good for ecology and it's uh, you know it's the same with footage like if you shoot once and you use it a hundred times that's good um, I, I met a, an artist when when I show uh, some film in Flaherty seminar and so I have uh, two films and so he see it there and I use exact uh, one scene for two films. And he told me, he said like, first time I realized that you can do that. It's actually, it's a great idea. I, start, I would start to do it. Uh, why, we, why we have the rule that we cannot reuse <laughs> our scenes? Yeah, so anyway, uh, I feel like, um, in, in, the, in the project or in the uh, material that I uh, either I shot or I um, uh, accumulated, um, there were always the, so many potentials that we haven't explored. And, um, and we can completely reuse and remarry them among each other and you know, many things. Um, um, so, I mean, for this one, um, the process was quite long, so I, now I can't really remember, but <laughs> I think um, the, so the, the experiment with like mirrors and everything, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing. It's, it's kind of like a separate thing that to experiment with the uh, forms and, and uh, possibility for projecting and for kind of scattering images. Um, and but the film themselves, um, it's it's kind of it's different. Um, I feel like I could go back to the the Vietnam War movies that I already used before, but now I would really try to to scan for the uh, the natural scenes, and um, and later I also decided to also use the Vietnamese movies as well. So it became kind of like instead of like um, only Hollywood movies uh, and nature, I think now it become more complicated 
it's kind of like a three-way, you know, it's like, uh, it's kind of like two sides of the Cold War, but then both sides of the Cold War also look at nature in the same way. So it's kind of like more like, a, you know, it's expanding it. It's not just like, it's always pointing at Hollywood, but it's our, our actually our kind of like human and gaze to the non-human. Um, so I also like work with, uh, I also work with the Vietnamese movies before, but now I scan more films that, you know, might have kind of natural setting. And, um, and then I also wanted to use, reuse my footage that I shot of the indig indigenous people um, from my previous film. But actually what you, what you read, the, the subtitle in the film, um, it's not what they are talking about. Actually, they are talking about either in Vietnamese or in Jarai, um, they talk about different things. But I, the, the subtitle you read, it's the fiction, it's a fiction that I combined from Ursula Le Guin's uh, novels, science fiction. Um, actually, her novel, um, The World for One is Forest, was the reaction to the Vietnam War. Uh, but she was so. Sh but it's a science fiction way that she was talking about kind of this um, this planet that has the full of forests and uh, you know the species uh, like people from outside come to colonize it and then you know cut down on the forest and in the process these people these green people in this forest they um, they didn't they didn't have any concept of, of violence. Um, but because they have to defend for, for their planet, so they try to kick out the, the people uh, from outside. And uh, so through this um, um, experience, they, uh, violence was actually introduced to them for the first time. Um, so they managed to kick out the invaders, but at the end, um, they learn about violence. Um, yeah, so I use, you know, several novels that she wrote um, to, to make this fiction story about a man who was lost in the forest and lost his memories and uh, come to live with the villagers and uh, they help him to restore his memories. And, um, uh, but mostly I, I just like her kind of some description of nature and of uh, forest and the sound and she was talking also about the wind and listening and um, in one of the novels she was um, actually talking about uh, plant consciousness and that was very early she was I think she was really pioneering she was like writing all these novels in the 60s and 70s and so that was very early um, now people start to talk about plants consciousness. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of things. <laughs> but anyway, so I kind of, I kind of feel like when I put a diff different subtitle for people to read and these people, they were talking about something else. I feel like, um, yeah, because like we, I feel like as human, we, we always feel like we have the um, the privilege, uh, uh, or especially like uh, people from majority or center, we kind of have the privilege to access everything, you know, to access, um, you know, non-human things and also access the own kind of uh, other people, you know, like um, we need to understand everything. We need to know what exactly what they are talking about, but we don't. They are talking about other things, and so we read the subtitle. And we think that that's what we understand, but that's not. And but I can reveal what they actually talk about. They talk about their tradition of listening, and how and about the history of Christianity being introduced to uh, Central Highlands and how, you know, kind of their tradition of uh, animism have died, stuff like that, their rituals. Thanks so much, T. Um, I'm quite mindful of time, but I think we'll have one more question. Yeah. <laughs> Could you repeat? 
Hello. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, also for yesterday, as you know, we had a chat. I spent a very long time in that room. I'm not quite sure how long because I kind of got into this zone. Um, and one of the things that I was t thinking about after being, in, so I have a question and then I have, I have a comment that kind of hopefully will lead to the question. And the comment has to do with sediment. Um, and something that you said just now about the Mekong um, kind of losing its sediment, which kind of was part of the living biodiversity process of this body of water. And when we were talking yesterday, I was also thinking about the w the way that, you know, on the one hand, you have all this found footage. I didn't find it at all excessive. <laughs> I mean, you were saying just now that it was a lot. I didn't find it a lot, but there were these layers of, of sound and image that are being refracted and reflected and sort of then somehow falling to the ground through the sound, through the, the speakers that you put on the floor and becoming a kind of collated sediment within the body. Um, so there's this kind of reprocessing that you're doing, which is a sort of a form, a form of sedimentation, which is not redemptive, right? It's not like make everything better. It's troubled sedimentation, but it's a, it, it makes for a very embodied process. And then the thing that I feel makes for this very embodied process is the temporalities that you've chosen, right? And I, the, so my question has to do with temporalities, more than human temporalities, sound less, and silence. Because for me, it really, it's, it's that time and that's the silences as well that precisely allow for that process of embodied sedimentation to, to, to manifest. Yeah. Wow, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> Can you write something for me? <laughs> so you want me to... I just love, I just love talking to academic people. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, Lucy is a great artist. <laughs> so I talk to you as artist then. <laughs> anyway, I, I guess, um, I think like when I do things, um, I, I, I don't really kind of, um, I do things in a more intuitive way. Yes, I, I don't really kind of um, analyze it too much. Um, but so, let's see, what can I say? Mm. Yes, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. Um, so for the, for the title, actually, uh, for both works, this work and the one in Chiang Rai, uh, both works has soundless in there. This one has 47 days soundless, and the other one is just soundless. Um, I think maybe at the beginning when, when I try to think of a title, um, when I wrote the proposal, um, it was, I think, I guess the first reason was maybe just kind of to play with words because, I, because I'm so interested in sound now. So I kind of like want to, to use a word that is opposite and I was also thinking about um, Chris Marker's film, Sunless. Um, his essay film was very important to me uh, at the, you know, some time ago with like, you know, um, with that film, Sunless too. And so, um, so I think at the beginning, it was more like a, a words kind of thing. But the more I think about it, the, the more I think it makes sense. And, and it's kind of resonate in different ways. Um, so for example, in, in, uh, in the work in Chiang Rai, um, when, when I was talking to the, the activist, I, I asked him um, about the sounds that he could remember from his childhood being with the river. And he described, you know, like swimming in the river and all kind of insects and things. And, um, but then he said that, um, um, but now he, he said that, but now the river is dying, and when it dies, there won't be no sound anymore. So I think about that, no sound, 
as a um, indication of death. Um, yeah, so it, it kind of has that kind of meaning. Um, yeah, because like people ask like how how can we translate this tran this soundless word to different languages? Because uh, in different languages, there's if if you translate, they might be just kind of like equal to quiet or something like that. That that doesn't have that meaning, you know. Of of and and to me, sound sound to me, it's something that make everything alive. It's really alive, more than image. Like if I could just listen to to sound in the space, I just feel the whole space is just alive. And I really like one quote by Oscar or Fischinger. He said that everything in the world has its own spirits, which could be released by its sound or by putting it to vibration. And so I think to me, like sound is kind of equal to life. And um, yeah, and so soundless, is, it's has the, one of the meaning can be like death or without life. Um, uh, and um, 40, 47 days was, um, because I just have to come up quickly with the name. <laughs> and so, and, and, and I was writing it when, uh, during COVID, so nobody could travel anywhere. And I was, and I wanted to kind of connect these two indigenous group. You know, one is from Central Highlands in Vietnam, and the other is the Ifugao in uh, Philippines. And I put in uh, Google map to see like how long it would take to go there, because I wanted to go there myself. And, and I want also want to see what is the distance between these two groups. And the Google map at that time, they have no flights or anything. So they give me 47 days by walking. And, and maybe ferry, I don't know if they have ferry, but it's for 47 days. So I was kind of thinking in COVID isolation, uh, thinking of the, the distance and of these two indigenous people in Southeast Asia who actually share the same ritual of buffalo killing. And yeah, so it's kind of like, just kind of feel like the space of the distance, but also the connection. And it's interesting to, to think about the distance in terms of walking. And so I just put in like 47 days and soundless. <laughs> it's just, uh, it doesn't really have kind of a proper meaning or something, but it's, it's kind of, I, I like it because it kind of mark a time. Yeah, I just feel like. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, T. I think everybody can agree with me how generous T is. Um, and I'm also quite mindful that it's more than an hour. So, but if you have any questions, um, I think we still have some snacks, I think, and some drinks, so please um, feel free to take them. And I guess, um, I think the most favorite thing I, I, I enjoyed from this conversation was the fact that sound cannot be controlled. It's, it's so natural and it's so very human, and I think that's something um, I, I, I want to think some more as well. Yeah. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of Singapore Art Week.